All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today at Bible Baptist Church Online. We hope that today will truly be a help to you. And if you would, please, would you take your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 5 with me. Mark chapter 5, and we'll get right into the message this morning. And the part of the Bible that we're going to be looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning, centralizes again on the person of Jesus Christ. It centralizes specifically on his power. And Jesus Christ had just taken the time and had just asked 12 men to come follow him. And those 12 men answer the call and they begin following Jesus Christ. The, the, they begin following him. They begin learning from him. They begin understanding his teaching. The followers of Jesus Christ are actually called disciples. And so the disciples were with Jesus. They were with him pretty much everywhere he went. And they were with him when religious leaders began asking Jesus questions. And Jesus answered these questions like they had never heard before. He began answering them in such a, a, a profound way. Jesus taught them many lessons. And he usually taught them through stories or parables. And this one particular day, they're sitting on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, right beside the, the shore there, and just spending time. And Jesus begins teaching them. He begins teaching them the, story, the parable, excuse me, of the sower and the seed. He begins teaching them about how the kingdom of God is likened unto a mustard seed. And they pretty much sit there all day learning from Jesus and spending time with him and understanding all of his teachings. They pretty much are there the entire day. And a little bit later that evening, Jesus says to the disciples, he says, hey, we're going to the other side. Let's go to the other side. And so they begin to make preparations. They get out onto the sea and an incredible storm comes up. The disciples are there. They're, these are weathered fishermen. They know what they're doing out on the Sea of Galilee, yet they are scared. And they watch as Jesus stands up at the front of the boat and says, Peace be still to the storm. And the storm literally falls flat immediately. Like there was nothing that happened. They, the Bible literally tells us that they were exceedingly afraid because they asked, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Jesus' power. Within a few hours of Jesus uh, calming the storm, they are making their way to see a little girl who has passed away. As they're making their way, a woman that has had an issue of blood, the Bible says, for 12 years. Meets them on the way, and in her mind, she knew that if she could just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, then she would be healed. She had tried everything she could try up until this point, but she knew that the power of Jesus could heal her. And sure enough, she just touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and she was healed. The power of Jesus. They eventually make it to this little girl's house where she had passed away, and Jesus walks in and raises this little girl to life. The power of Jesus Christ. And the disciples are there watching this all. And, and wow, and just absolute and utter amazement of who this Jesus is. These are awesome stories. These are amazing stories. And they show the power of Jesus Christ. But inside of these three stories, nestled in between them, is a story of great deliverance. We kind of skipped over it. If you'll remember, Jesus said to the disciples, hey guys, let's go to the other side of the boat. Excuse me, the other side of the sea. Let's go to the other side of the sea. Jesus went over to the other side of the sea for one reason only. He had to get to the other side. And you say, why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? This is not the purpose. He didn't want to just go sightseeing. He had a purpose to get there. And so we pick up the story in Mark chapter 5 and verse 1. The Bible says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, watch this, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling in the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces neither could any man tame him and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones 
See, Jesus went to the other side of the sea specifically to see this demon-possessed man. This narrative gives us an extremely clear picture of what a demon-possessed human being looks like and what he's struggling with. We don't necessarily encounter a demon-possessed person that displays all of these attributes here in Canada. It's not a part of really our culture. But it was in this day, and honestly, there are other parts of the world currently in 2021 that you could see this type of this, this attributes, this behavior displayed. Places like Haiti, places like Vanuatu. We have a missionary there that uh, we, we talk to often. Man, some of these things are very present and very real in their lives. And so this may not seem like it's something that's close to you, but I think there's some things we can draw conclusion from. Let me ask you this question as we just get started here. Do you think that this demon-possessed man just all of a sudden woke up one day, and we'll find out a little bit later that, and he just all of a sudden had about 2,000 demons inside of him? Do you think he just all of a sudden happened overnight? Well, the Bible doesn't give us much about his backstory doesn't tell us where he came from. doesn't tell us about his parents. doesn't tell us about his childhood. doesn't tell us much about anything. It just shows us what has happened. And so we don't necessarily know, but we do know this. The Bible tells us that Satan is subtle. He's divisive. He is cunning. He will work slowly. He will work methodically until he has completely destroyed us. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, the, the Satan is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. In fact, Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 11, they both tell us about a man who had a demon inside of him. That demon was cast out. And that demon goes around and looks for another host. This man who had the demon begins to clean up his life. Begins to dust everything out and try to dress it up from the outside and make everything as clean and as good as he possibly can. That demon goes and looks for a host but cannot find one and comes back to this man and sees that everything's clean. Everything's furnished, the Bible says. And he enters again into that man. But this time he doesn't enter alone. He enters again with seven more demons. So just suffice it to say Being possessed with 2,000 demons doesn't just happen overnight. It seems as if this man had obviously tried to clean up multiple times. Again, they had tried to bind him with fetters and chains. Again, if, if you're breaking fetters and chains, how are they even getting them on you in the first place? Right? Like... If you're that strong, there's no way they're putting any of those things on here. So it, it, it appears that there was a progression. The Bible tells us that there were many times that he and the people tried their best to even tame him. If you will, they threw everything they had at him. I can imagine it this way. Them sitting down with him. He had just gone a little crazy at a kid's birthday party. Right? Like he just, whoa, like, hey, settle down, buddy. And they pull him aside and the elders of the city take him and set him down and, hey, you can't be doing that. And they begin to try to work with him. And sure enough, he seems like he's workable and teachable. And so they decide they want to introduce him back into society. So as they begin to prepare, they think, oh, a a fancy dinner will be the ticket. We'll introduce this man back into society. He'll dress up in a nice three-piece suit. He'll be such a wonderful representation. So sure enough, the day comes when they introduce him back into society. And instead of minding his manners and, and, and being a good guest, he goes crazy. He jumps up on the table, starts breaking dishes, starts throwing food at all the guests. And again, they grab a hold of him and say, you can't do that. And he just won't listen. He begins screaming. He begins yelling and shouting. Everything they try to do to him, they re- he resists. And this demon-possessed man is now, if, again, this is my imagination, put in a straight jacket, right? They try and talk to him and just, hey, settle down. And he just continues to scream at them and scream at them. After a few days, he begins to calm down. And they begin to talk to him and try to help him again. And after a few days, he's calm and he spent a good deal of time. And so these elders of the city decide that, hey, maybe it's time we can introduce him to some more people. 
take the straight jacket off and bring some people in. And again, he goes crazy and actually hurts someone. At this point, they don't know what else to do with him, so they strap some fetters and chains on his hands, on his ankles, and they literally don't know what else to do, and so they chain him to a wall until he settles down. But this time, things are progressively getting worse. They lock him in jail, and he breaks those chains. He breaks those fetters off. He escapes out of jail, and he goes and tears the town apart. And listen, they can't have this anymore, so they kick him out of the city. They put him in a nearby cemetery, and that's where he takes up residence. He no longer could be with the living people. He had to spend time with dead people. And then the Bible tells us that night and day he spent in the tombs, screaming, cutting himself. Cutting himself, not, not just little scratches. I'm talking about major gashes with, with stones. He's cutting himself and bleeding and there's scars. And this is just a horrible, terrible thing to happen to a person. They don't know what else to do with him. They had literally tried everything they could do to reform him from the outside. There may be some listening here today that maybe you're going through a very difficult time with things internally. Man, some things are just really eating you apart and you're trying to change them externally. You're trying to dress it up from the outside. You're trying to take care of it from the outside externally. But every time you try to change something internally by doing something externally, that internal problem just continues to get worse and worse and worse. Again, this man did not need reformation he needed transformation. We literally see this all the time in our society. And Charles Spurgeon writes this. Such cases have we often seen. Young men who have been rescued uh, uh, from a course of vice. And who have been for a season helped toward virtue. But they have broken loose again. There was no holding them in. They had not learned self-restraint. And therefore no one else could restrain them. So true, we, and we see this all the time with alcoholics. We see this all the time with drug addicts. We see this all the time with abusers. And listen, the list could go on and on and on and on and on. But again, here's what we see, and we have a tendency to see. We see the end game. We see them as abusers. We see them as drug addicts. We see them as alcoholics. We see them at the worst. And what we typically do is we say, well, I'm not as bad as them. I'm not quite that far. We look at this maniac of Gadara. We see this demon-possessed man. We go, well, I'm not that bad. But again, we forget that if we continue down that path, the path that we're currently on, saying, listen, I'm just going to try to clean up the outside. I know I've got some internal problems. I know I've got some wars going on inside of me. I'm just going to clean up the outside. What happens is we too will end up as an abuser. We too will end up as a drug addict. We too will end up as an alcoholic. We too will end up, again, I don't know where your path leads you, but it will lead to a dis destruction. We'll end up with some serious internal and external scars, just like this man. And I don't know the severity of where you will land. But I know that Satan wants you to land in destruction. The Bible continues in verse 6. And this is really where the story begins to turn. And it's so amazing. The Bible says in verse 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And cried with a loud voice and says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he, being Jesus, said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. So Jesus literally steps off the boat. And immediately, the Bible says, immediately, as soon as he steps off the boat, there is the maniac, the, the demon-possessed man, there. And he falls down and worships him. Meets him immediately. I have a theory, and I have no doubt that this is true. Again, I cannot prove it necessarily biblically. I believe that this man watched this storm come up on the Sea of Galilee. And he watched this storm overtaking this little boat. And they 
watched as Jesus stepped to the front of the boat and raised his hands, and maybe he could even hear peace be still. No doubt this man is beginning to think, wow, if that man can calm the storm on the sea, maybe he can calm the storm that's going on in me. And maybe you're here today and you just got a storm going on inside. Listen, Jesus can calm the storm that's going on in your heart. Jesus is on the coast now and this man comes and worships him. Jesus knows exactly what's going on. And he says, you can see this in verse 8, for he had said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. So he's, he's rebuking the spirit. He's rebuking the demon, saying, come out of the man. And the demon's retort was something very interesting. Something that most people in our city, most people in our culture would never say. Look what the demons say in verse 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee? Watch now. Jesus, thou son of the most high God. Jesus, thou son of the most high God. They literally call Jesus the son of the most high God. The demons knew that Jesus was the son of God. They knew it. And there may be some that, that listen to this that believe that Jesus was a good man. There may be some that listen to this that believe that Jesus was a good prophet. But listen, the devils know exactly who Jesus is. They know that he is the son of the most high God. Listen, this has great implications for our theology, our Christology. We believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. In fact, the Bible calls Jesus Emmanuel which means God with us. So he's not just some good man. He's not just some good prophet. Listen, he is the only begotten son of God. That is so important to remember. God in the flesh. And the demons very simply beg the son of God not to torment them. Finish verse 7. I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. And we could get into all the details as to what this torment is. But watch how Jesus responds to this. Again, he says to the man, the man falls down and worships him. He says to the man, come out of him unclean spirit. And they say, what have I to do with thee, thou Jesus, thou Jesus, the son of the most high God? Don't torment us. Watch how Jesus responds, verse 9. And he, being Jesus, asked him, what is thy name? And he, being the demon-possessed man answered saying my name is legion for we are many see jesus responds by asking him his name now to me if i'm listening to this story listen jesus like let's get on with the formalities here like let's get to the real meat of the problem here like why does it matter what his name is such small minute details jesus like come on let's go most of us think that Jesus should have responded with great authority. Hey, demon, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'll torment you if I want to torment you. I am God, and I'm going to display my authority. Most people would think that's how Jesus should have responded, but he didn't. Jesus simply asked him his name. Now, again, you might think that's such a minute detail, but I believe this is the crux of the entire thing. The fact that Jesus asked for his names shows two things. Number one, it shows that Jesus is personal. Let me say that again. Jesus is personal. Jesus understands what is going on inside of you. He understands the problems. He understands the war. He understands the storm that's going on inside of you. And guess what? Jesus knows your name. He wants to know your name. He had come from the other side of the sea specifically for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with this man. He had weathered a storm. He had calmed a storm specifically for this man. Listen, Jesus is personal. That's so important. He knows you. He knows what's going on inside of you. But number two, I want you to think about this. Did Jesus, being God, 
Did he already know this man's name? Well, yes, absolutely. God knows everything. In fact, the Bible tells us that God knows the very hairs that are on our head. He knows how many there are. That's incredible. So did he know his name? Absolutely he knew his name. So this just isn't just information for us. This has a purpose. Jesus asked this man, what is your name? Who are you? Listen, this name was a definition. Notice what his name is. He answered saying, my name is Legion. And he defines himself. He says this, for we are many. Jesus asked this man, how do you view yourself? How do you define yourself? Let me ask you the same question this morning. How do you view yourself? If I was going to ask you to define yourself, how would you define yourself? Would you define yourself as happy, joyful? Would you define yourself as depressed? Would you define yourself as great internal struggle? Listen, The second point of this is so important. This man had to be honest with himself and with Jesus. This man had to be honest with himself and with Jesus and define who he truly was. Listen, so often we want to hide who we are, don't we? So often we want to hide who we truly are. Listen, I get to stand up in front of people today. And you may only know me by me standing up in front of you and preaching. Listen, I, we always ought to be who we are all the time. Listen, but sometimes people who are in front of people, they go home and they're somebody different. Maybe you go to work. You're in front of people and you're one person. You go home and you're someone different. In fact, we don't like the person that we've become when we go home. So we tried it. We try to hide it from everyone else. We try to hide it even from ourselves. It's kind of like we're Smeagol or Gollum from Lord of the Rings, right? When he's with Frodo and Sam, man, he's kind of a nice guy and he's kind of playful. And, but when they're sleeping, man, he becomes this evil, wicked, degenerate full of malice. And listen, we're kind of like that. We're one thing in front of people and we're playing with sin by ourselves. We we become degenerate and full of malice. We're selfish and we just continue to get further down, further down and further down. It just comes darker and darker. So listen, this morning you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be honest with yourself and you have to be honest with Jesus. You have to simply recognize your need. You have to say, listen, I realize that I've got a battle going on inside of me. I realize that I'm not going the right direction. I realize that this is a problem. I can't do it. I can't reform myself anymore. I need to be transformed. You have to recognize your need. I believe up until this point, this man had never truly recognized his need. He had just tried to fix everything outwardly and he had people who were trying to help him fix things outwardly man our society's like man get yourself around good friends and they will help you that's good i believe that's good advice but that is not the the cure that's helpful but it is not the cure i'm sure if he were in our society he would have been even one who attended church a couple of times but see nothing would rid him completely of these demons except Jesus Jesus was the only one who could deliver him from his internal war Jesus was the only one who could deliver him from these demons but listen I believe Jesus could not deliver him until he was first honest with himself and again you can see the whole thing wrapping up why in the world would he come to Jesus Unless he knew his need. Why in the world would he say, I am legion for we are many, unless he knew his need? This man knew his need and you have to know your need. Let me ask you this question. What narrative are you believing? What narrative are you believing this morning about yourself? You see, the narrative of Satan and his demons 
makes you feel special in the moment. Let me say that again. The narrative of Satan and his demons makes you feel special in the moment. He will tell you how wonderful you are. He will tell you how much you deserve to watch pornography. Man, your, your spouse, your girlfriend, man, they were just mean to you today. You deserve to look at pornography today. You deserve to uh, uh, fulfill that lust. You deserve to be angry because they weren't treating you properly. You deserve that. You make you feel special in the moment. Man, you deserve to yell at your wife. You deserve to yell at your spouse. You, you're justified in that. You go right ahead and, and tell that person, and he'll even make you feel wonderful about it. Man, you'll just feel a little bit better if you will just... Listen, he will make you feel special in the moment. The narrative of Satan will make you feel special in the moment, but it leads you to the path of destruction. It leads you down the path of destruction. You see, what he'll do is he'll keep telling you, just a little bit further. Just one more look. Just one more girl. Just one more drink. Just one more injection. Just one more. And then you'll feel wonderful. Hey, remember how wonderful you felt when you did that last time? You remember how you felt when you did that last time? Just one more. Just one more. And you will, you will continue to try and try and try, but you will never be fulfilled. You will continue to try and fix it from the outside. You will continue to try. Satan will make you feel special about it. But you will continue to get further down, further down, and darker and darker and darker. No doubt this is exactly where this man was in this predicament. But conversely, the narrative of God, listen, the narrative of God makes you feel, feel horrible in the moment. The narrative of God makes you feel horrible in the moment. Why? Because we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with Jesus. Listen, yes, I look at pornography. Yes, I take drugs. Yes, I drink too much. Yes, I, I mean, you fill in the blank. You have to be honest with yourself and with God. You have to be honest. I am wicked. I am a sinner. And guess what Jesus is going to do? Jesus is going to point out your flaws. Jesus is going to say, you got a problem. He's going to show you where you are wrong. Listen, the, the narrative of Jesus makes you feel horrible in the moment. But listen, the pur purpose of that is to get you to realize who you are. It makes you feel horrible in the moment, but it leads to everlasting life. If you will come to Jesus and you will trust him, you will be honest with him. He will free you from your burden and give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. At thy right hand, the Bible says, there are pleasures forevermore. Jesus knows we are broken. He knows it. You can see it. He's just waiting for you to be honest. Jesus can came to give us life, and the Bible says to give it more abundantly. But the, let's, let's be honest this morning. Not one of us likes to be told that we're doing something wrong. I have several people in my life that have told me that I've been wrong. And I'll be honest with you, I do not jump up and down for joy when I'm told I'm wrong. I don't. I hate it. Uh, my stomach starts to get real tight. I get a bit nauseated. My face starts to get real flush. I begin to think very quickly. My heart rate begins to go up. My mind begins to rationalize why I did what I did. And very often, my mouth will speak the words to rationalize why I did what I did. None of us likes to be told that we are wrong. But until we are honest with ourselves, until we admit we have a problem, we cannot move forward. So let me encourage you this morning, don't believe the lies of Satan. That you are something special. 
Don't believe the lies of Satan that you deserve something. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Be honest before God. Because, listen, without Jesus, we are nothing. This story is such a great picture. Man, I've tried everything, absolutely everything to get right. And I can't. I need Jesus Christ. Let's finish the story. Mark chapter 10, or 5, verse 10. And he besought him much, and he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine, uh, pigs feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked into the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. Watch this, verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting, watch, and clothed, watch, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Jesus completely heals this man, sends the demons that were inside of him, sends them into a herd of pigs. The pigs run violently down a hill and die. Destruction. That's what Satan wants. This man was completely transformed. There was no more uh, 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 trying to reform things from the outside. By the way, notice that his outside was changed. He was sitting. Doesn't sit very often, right? Constantly going crazy, clothed. The Bible says that he was naked in other passages and in his what? Right mind. You see what Jesus did? Jesus changed his heart first. Jesus changed the inside out. Listen, you could be sitting here this morning and you might be thinking, man, I just need a little bit more reform. I just need to change a little bit. No, 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 no. Every single one of us needs transformation. We need God to do something inside of us. We find out if you read the rest of the passage all the way down to verse 20, you see that this man truly becomes one of the greatest missionaries. One of the greatest uses and one of the greatest proclaimers of what Jesus Christ had done inside of him. Man, powerful transformation. Listen, Jesus can completely transform your life. Jesus can completely transform your life. Listen, no more trying to reform. No more trying to fix things from the outside and returning to them over and over and over and over and over again. Come to Jesus. Be honest with him about your need. God, I can't do this. I've tried. I've tried to be happy. I've tried to do everything I could possibly imagine. I just can't be happy. I can't have that joy. I'm struggling. I've got a war going on inside of me. Come to him. Ask him to heal you. Let me ask you this morning. The path that you're on right now. The path that you're on right now. Where does it lead? Where does it lead you? Look ahead. Does it lead you down a path of true joy? Or does it lead you down a path that continues to get darker and darker and darker? Jesus wants to lead you to life. You might be here this morning and listening that, and you've never met Jesus. You've never come to him. We would love to introduce him to you this morning. You might be here this morning, you already know Jesus Christ. But you've been dabbling in sin. You've been playing with sin. The longer you dabble in that sin, the darker your path is going to get. It's going to become increasingly more difficult. What's going to happen is you're going to begin justifying that. You're going to begin trying to dress up the outside. You're going to be trying to talk to talk. Big talk. But listen, your end will be destruction. I'm not trying to say that you'll lose your salvation. But listen, you will not have a wonderful, beautiful, light-filled, joyful life when you're dabbling in sin. And listen, it's just going to get worse. 
Be honest with yourself this morning. Come to him. Tell him he, you need his help. And let him start working on you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all you do for us. Father, I pray that as we look at our lives, help us to be honest with ourselves. Father, thank you so much for convicting me, things that I need to be honest about before you. Father, I pray that I would be so honest, Father, that you would begin working in my life and removing those things that don't need to be there anymore and that are hindering my relationship with you, that are hindering my service for you. And Father, for these that listen the same, and Father, if there's one here that does not know you, this personal Savior never met you, Father, I pray that today would be the day they fall on their knees and they worship you. Father, you remove that sin load from them. Father, I pray that your will is accomplished today. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you just to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning. Again, if, if you've never met Jesus, we would love to introduce you to him today. We want to start that conversation with you. So very simply, this is what I want you to do. You can exit this video. And I very simply just want you to click on that link that's in the description. It's just a connect card. Just fill that thing out and in the comments just write, I want to start a conversation with Jesus. That's it. So I want you to go ahead and do that right now. But maybe you're here today and you're thinking, man, you know what? I am saved, but I've just been living a lie. So let me ask you, what narrative are you believing? We want to give you some time today just to spend some time with God and to be honest with him. So if you've got a sin problem, let's be honest with God. Let's give you some time to do that right now.